Thank you. I now call on the Minister of Health, uh, Robin Swan, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion and the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and can I honestly thank the members of this House for their, their contributions. But I want also to thank them all for the, the acknowledgement they've paid to, to my staff and the health and social care staff, domiciliary staff, pharmacists, doctors, GPs, all those across Northern Ireland who are working. To, I think what it was Mr. Jim Allister said, not just for what we're, where we are now, but what is still to face us. And I think as members, that's when we will look to your assistance and help um, in the future in your understanding. Um, just to, to update members while we were away, there, there has been a lot of issues raised in regards to, to PPE. Um, just to make members um, fully aware, earlier on today I have authorised the release of 30 per cent of our pandemic stockpile. It is probably earlier than we wished we could have, but because of I suppose, the concerns that have been raised. But the additional pressure now comes on those within the trust, within the GPs, with every other facility, to make sure that that PPE is managed wisely, because that is the challenge at this moment in time. It is a challenge that I can't manage. It is a challenge that my tar department can't manage on that, social, on that low or that level of the front line. So there is a responsibility there. And folks, I, I stood here a fortnight ago and I said about how sanitizer was being stolen from our hospitals. Folks, face masks are being stolen from our, from our emergency departments. So the pressure may be on us as a department, as in a trust, to make sure that the PPE is there and is available. But there's also a responsibility on the wider public to make sure that it's available for those who need it when they need it. Um, in regards to the contributions um, today, and members, if you indulge me, I want to cover as many of them as I can because I am one of those ministers who has stopped assembly questions or stopped answering them because simply we had reaching nearly 800. Um, and members, if someone looked at some of those questions today in hindsight, they'd wondered were they really worthwhile asking. And if some people from the outside this house looked at some of those questions, they would actually ask why were they ever asked in the first place. So in regards to the contributions, um, and, and I'll start with, with the Deputy Chair um, of, of the committee, um, raised a number of issues in regards to the well-being and deployment of students and retirees, and that was raised by a number of members. I can assure members that those students, retirees, and, and indeed the volunteers that we're asking for, which will be empowered under this bill under the VEF scheme, will have the necessary training and support, and that their health and safety is paramount. Whilst these measures are being progressed urgently, essential processes for recruitment are still taking place, but, but much faster. And in regards to where they will be deployed, these staff will be deployed as operational needs required, making sure that we have a balance in the need that is there, but also matched up with the skills and experience of, of the level of, of the people who are, are, are supplying them. Um, the Deputy Chair also asked in regards to the indemnity for health and social care activity. Um, health and the provision of clinical neg negligence indemnity to health care workers and others carrying out NH NHS activities is a devolved matter. Um, so Clause 12 provides powers to provide indemnity for clinical negligence liabilities arising from HSC activities carried out for the purpose of dealing with it or in consequence of the coronavirus outbreak where there is no existing indemnity arrangement already um, in place. Um, the Deputy Chair also asked in regards to the sectors where employees um, can absence themselves in regards for the emergency volunteers. This actually covers employees and workers who are engaged in COVID-19 volunteer activity. So it does include agency workers uh, and those eligible will receive compensation for the loss of earnings and travel expenses. Uh, and the, this, the, the scheme has actually been designed on a UK-wide basis, but in regards to how we actually manage some of our other volunteers coming forward, I spoke with the, the Minister of Communities this morning and she's engaging as to how we manage that. Because this is an executive-wide approach. Although I'm leading in this bill today, it's because it is, is, is health-based, it is health-grounded. 
the response to this is across the executive. Um, in regards to the chair also, or the, the deputy chair also raised the, the issue in regards to volunteer and leave. Emergency volunteer leave will create temporary unpaid statutory rights for eligible employees and workers so they can take emergency volunteer leave. It's a day one right for employees and workers and it will be up for a period of 16 weeks. An employee or worker may only take only one period of um, emergency volunteer leave in any volunteering period and that must be in a block of two, three, four weeks. So it's fair on their employer as well and because if they're taking up a volunteering space within, within the health and social care system it's actually so it's providing value as well. Um, moving on then um, to uh, John O'Dowd raised a number of questions um, in regards to, and I think it was a valid point, be under no illusion we will lose businesses and we will lose jobs. But my aim as Minister of Health is to lose as few lives as possible. Because that's where our focus must be and should be at all times. He said life would go back to normal. Folks, I don't see the normal going back to what we perceived it to be. There will be a new normal. We look at life differently. We look at society differently because be under no illusion this will have a profound effect on how we respond to society afterwards. He also asked in regards to the, the rationale for, for the amendment that I, uh, I moved this morning. Um, the amendment to the legisl legislative uh, consent motion was simply an amendment to capture some last minute amendments um, to the bill and to make sure that these provisions were included in the bill and they were raised by, by the Department of Communities uh, to refer to district, district council meetings, business improvement districts, statutory sick pay and commercial leases and business tenancies. So that was the reason for the amendment, to make sure that we captured within this bill um, what, what, we, what we could. In regards to the, the chair of the TEO, and, and I think, again, I, I just want to reinforce um, that in the House, and what the, there are a number of chairs and vice chairs of various committees raised. The contents of this bill cover the executive office, economy, communities, justice, DERA, education, health, all have input into this bill. Um, I got the, the privilege and honour to lead it because COVID-19 is seen as, as a health, health matter. Um, so in regards to the, the point that many members have made, um, in regards to the six-month clause. Uh, a new clause for six-month review has been added, and this allows for the House of Commons to express a view on the continued operation of the legislation, and the review clause does not apply to the temporary measures um, that are actually being devolved. But what I would say to members of this House, as Health Minister, for the parts of this bill that are within my remit and within the function and action of my department, I'll come back here and give you regular updates. I've committed to do that as Minister. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not adverse to, to taking the criticism of this House, should it be constructive or otherwise. I've been here too long to, to let this issue get, get to me. To pers well, it does get to me personally, but to the challenge of members in this House get to me. Uh, in regards to the, the Chair of the Executive Office, he also asked in, 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 in regards to pension for retired, uh, retired returnees and the recon reconfiguration to be temporary. Uh, the Pensions Clause of 45 exists to remove any pension restrictions as an obstacle, so that has already been covered in the bill and it's open for something that we actually can, we can do as, as we need to deploy. Um, in regards to, I, I think it was uh, the, the enforcement advice uh, on, on what can be closed, as I said earlier, the bill provides for enforcement of the measures of closing premises and prohibiting gatherings, so it's very important the social distancing measures. So these measures are, and enforcement powers focus on owners and occupiers of premises and organisers of the event. They do not target individual people, however foolish they may be, who choose to ignore advice and attend events. Members, I recognise that this may not be enough if individual people do not heed the instruction and continue to behave in a way that puts their own health and that of others at risk. So, if additional measures are needed, such as fixed penalty notices to deal with individuals who behave irresponsibly, then, with the agreement of my executive colleagues, we will not hesitate um, to 
he introduced them. In regards to, I think, the contribution then from, from other members, uh, from my own party leader, leader um, Steve Egan, he said, as we face this crisis, it will bring out the best of us. Folks, I hope it also shames the worst of us who cannot see that their selfish actions today, yesterday and tomorrow will cost lives. They will put pressure on our health service that will see it not being able to cope. And I think John O'Dowd's uh, contribution in regards to that, that, that depiction of someone who is irresponsible today not being able to be beside a loved one because they suffer from the severe ravages of what COVID-19 will bring. Um, in regards to, to Paula Bradshaw's contribution, um, she referred to those within the community and the volunteers who are stepping up. Folks, we can't allow that spirit of volunteering, that spirit of contribution to be in vain, or we can't fail them and being able to support them to be able to do that. She also mentioned in regards to challenges, and I think Matthew O'Toole raised it as well. Folks, this bill will cause us to look at death in a very different way over the next few months. For what is the normal tradition from either side of this house, across all sides, of that of a wake, of visiting the house, of putting a friend, hand, friendly hand of comfort or a, a hug out to someone who has bereaved, is now no longer advisable or acceptable. Because that friendly hand of comfort, that hug of comfort, could add another life, the loss of another life or another death. So, folks, this is going to be tough. We're in a tough few months. Um, but we will see the other side. But if we don't listen to the advice that's been given, if we don't follow the guidance that's in this bill, not all of us will see the other side. And that's as basic and as blunt as a message as I can give. Um, the Chair of the Justice uh, Committee, Paul Gavin, made a number of comments. And you know, I was fortunate that my, my executive colleague, uh, the Justice Minister, actually addressed some of her concerns or some of her, her, her relevant parts in this bill yesterday. Um, if the executive needs to add additional legislation, um, it can. Uh, we can also supplement what's in this bill by, by regulations as well. So there is, there, there is an ability um, to do that. The, the chair of the Justice Committee also um, touched again on the human side of what COVID-19 means to each of us as MLAs, where it reaches out and hits what will hit a family will react to a family or how a family actually reacts to how we challenge this. In regards to social distancing and the word he used, that you know, people seem to be in ignorance or just not wanting to, to comply with the guidance we were given, those people may feel that they are immune because they're young. The statistics in Northern Ireland show at this moment in time, and Steve Egan referred to them, over a third of those tested positive for COVID-19 in Northern Ireland at this moment in time are under 40. The next third falls in that 44 to, to 65 age bracket, and the other, the other third are above that. So this isn't a virus that respects age. But for those young people who think they are immune, you will not be immune to the effects of some of the actions in this bill, nor will your loved ones be able to bask in your immunity from what you think is COVID-19? Because that's what the challenge to social distancing is actually about, to stop that spread within homes, within, within workplaces and within our, 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 our general society. And I will thank him for his prayers, um, because folks, for those, and there's many in Northern Ireland who rely on them and look to them at this minute in time, they are valued no matter what they are. And if you are in your place of worship, if you, I think it was Dave Allen said, if you have any God or no God, folks, say a prayer of thanks tonight for our health service and the work that they're doing. 
For the chair um, to the economy, she spoke of, um, spoke of the, the volunteer register. Um, again, I, I spoke to your colleague uh, this morning, uh, the Minister of Communities, because communities are leading in that. She also queried in regards to, to Article 36. Yes, it will only be used if, if it is needed, if we have to compel colleges, schools or childcare to actually open up to support um, the children of key workers, because it is those key workers that are keeping our health service running. Um, from the Chair of, of the Environment and Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee, he spoke of organisations, the GAA, Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster, and the support that they can give. It is also the support that they can give at this minute in time in preparing to support those in our community. Those um, who are facing isolation but without the family that many of us or most of us can rely on in here. So those who are socially isolated and distant within rural communities. Because what we're trying to do here in the steps and measures that we're taking, we don't want to isolate people from society. We want to shield them from this virus. There's a big difference and there's a responsibility that all other organisations can take and support in that. Um, in regards to Patsy McLuhan made contributions in regards to health workers um, being a key group. Patsy, 100 per cent. The more tests that we can get in place, and we raised, we've raised them now to 1,100 this morning. Now, I've taken criticism, as, as soon as I mentioned it this morning, I've taken criticism, criticism across this House that it's not enough. It's not enough. That's why we're pushing on. Three weeks ago, we were doing 32. We're now at 1,100. And that push continues to do more tests so that we can make sure that we can get our frontline staff back and work on as soon as possible and support their families, but also support the other groups that are there as well. And that's the groups who, who are vulnerable in our hospitals so that we make sure we're not, we're not treating non-COVID patients beside COVID patients, so we're not putting additional strain on our hospital facilities. So that if we, we find a case in a, in a care home or a, a severe educational learning disability facility, that we're not cohorting all those people together. So if we find one case, we can, we can test everyone around them. So we're focusing on those tests. As our capability increases, as it will, we'll target out and reach out to those who, who, can, who can use it. Um, Pansy, uh, you asked, will the public uh, powers available to the public health agency be extended to environmental health officers and district councils? Um, the public health regulation making powers under Clause 46 and Schedule 17 of the Bill can confer functions on the public health agency or other bodies or persons to help support the public health response of COVID-19. So, yes, they can be. The powers relating to potentially infectious persons, which is in Schedule 20, allow the Director of Public Health and the Public Health Agency to advise or direct others under arrangements to prevent or control the spread of coronavirus. So it's about how you actually deal and make sure we're using those people um, to the best of their, their ability and their skill set as well. In regards to support for people subject to early release um, from prison, my officials are working to ensure that um, mental health support is there for anyone who is suffering from mental health um, during this difficult time, and that support will include, include an increased online resource as, you know, as undoubtedly our, our workers in this area will, will fall, fall victim to this virus as well. So, in regards to what we're doing as well, in regards to mental health, it's also a major part of what my department does, but it's also supporting the other work we do and asking people to, to socially isolate. Um, in regards then, the Vice Chair of, of the Education Committee um, quoted Heaney, um, we will wonder this out. Folks, if we can get through to society to follow this guidance, to listen to the simple advices, there will be more of us. We will see the summer. It is as simple as that. So, Heaney's guidance was right, but we have to follow the guidance and the regulations and the direction that is coming from the Department of Health um, as well. Um, Mr Nesbitt, Mike Nesbitt then made, uh, an, or asked an, a number of questions in regards to the prohibition of events as a building site, a gathering, for example. Um, it is not in the intention or the policy intent behind, behind the clause for public events, but it is something that I know that my executive colleagues in, in TEO are looking at. 
Um, the legislation in relation to powers relating to events, gatherings and premises in Nor- Northern Ireland actually enables TEO to give directions, but before so, the TEO must have regard to any relevant advice published by the CMO or any deputy CMO of the Department of Health, and the TEO must consult with CMO before making the same. So before making the de- declaration of the risks of CV and NI and coronavirus in Northern Ireland, so as to enable the activation of powers relating to potentially infectious persons in Northern Ireland, the Department of Health must consult the CMO, and such declaration by the Department of Health must actually be published online and in the Belfast Gazette. So that I think that was one of the, the clarities or reassurances the member was, was actually looking for. Um, in regards to the contribution from uh, Martina Anderson, I think um, the message that she, she, she put forward in regards to that joint office and the perception of the joint office of our first and deputy first minister now, as they deliver the messages to the people of Northern Ireland, cannot be underestimated because it shows the unity of purpose that, that the executive has at this minute in time in challenge of the coronavirus bill. She also raised a number of um, issues in regards to the human rights effect of this bill. Um, Folks, the front of the bill carries the declaration on the European Convention of Human Rights, and the Secretary Matt Hancock has made the following statement under Section 19.1a of the Human Rights Act 1998. So, in my view, the provisions of the coronavirus bill are compatible with the Convention rights. That's similar and akin to declarations that are made in legislation here, any piece of legislation that we're moving in Northern Ireland. Um, Martina Anderson and Matthew Till also raised um, why do immigration officers need these powers and what will the powers allow an immigration officer to actually do? And I think it was the, over the concerns of the powers of um, immigration officers. The powers ensure that immigration officers can support the wider public health effort where they encounter a person who is or may be infectious during the course of their normal functions at the border or while exercising immigration enforcement functions in country. These proposed powers will allow an immigration officer to direct or remove such a person to a suitable place for the purpose of screening or assessment or to keep that person there for a suitable place for a time-limited period to be handed over to the relevant health authorities. That time limited period is up to three hours, but it can only be extended by a further nine hours. So immigration officers are required to consult a public health officer to the extent that it is practical before actually exercising those powers. Um, Justin McNulty then talked about uh, how this rule was was pressurised, but as I said last week or the week before, that it's also a privilege. It's an honour to hold this rule at this moment in time and represent an untiring and unrelentless and a dedicated workforce. Um, in regards to how I see health in this country at this moment in time, folks, health is more than a sound bite. Health is actually more than a headline to be chased, because at this minute in time, our health service means life itself for so many of our constituents. So let's not get distracted about what health could be doing, what health can be doing. Health at this moment in time is doing everything that we can possibly do. Matthew Till also raised the issue that it was time to be honest. Folks, since I took up this role when coronavirus and COVID-19 hit Northern Ireland, that's all I can do because I've been blunt, I've been frank, and at times I've probably went farther than some would have wished me to do in my public messaging. But for, to, get, to get the message home that 14 to 15,000 people in Northern Ireland could die if others don't take their responsibility seriously is a message that I cannot run home hard enough. And now is the time for people to act. In regards to, to the contribution from, from Rachel Woods, um, Rachel, you, you, your questions are well made um, in regards to how we, we look after our homeless, how we look after the vulnerable. Um, it's work that is ongoing, probably not fast enough, 
because what was actually said to me in a passing comment the other night, when Belfast became so depleted of normal shoppers, normal people, the numbers of homeless in our city actually became more extant and more apparent. And that's, that, that's a group that we should be tackling anyway. It's an issue that we should be tackling out with this bill, because most of the questions that you asked are out with this bill, but they're not out with the competency of the executive or my other ministerial colleagues. And that's where your questions have been made today, they've been heard today, and I've, I make sure that the transcript of this debate is shared with all my ministerial colleagues, as was raised, I think, by, by Claire Sugden as well, because although the focus is now on my department on what we can do in tackling COVID-19, um, it also has to be on others and how they support um, health approach. Um, you, you, she, sorry, Rachel, you, you also spoke about the removal of, of liberties. Um, for those who know, know me and my politics know that this bill would not be in my political way of going or my political thought uh, in any direction. But I see this bill as, ne as necessary because there's no greater removal of personal liberty than the removal of life. And if we don't enact and if we don't move quick enough at this point in time in the steps that we need to take, that's exactly um, what we're talking about. And it will be the greatest, greatest failure if we remove the liberty of life for more of our constituents than actually has to be. Um, moving, on, uh, moving on to, to, to Jim um, Alistair. Jim, I thank you for your personal words of support. Um, and not only for me, but the rest of our, our health department. I referred yesterday in, in media that I what was going to come forward because we'd had an indication that I thought they were draconian. Now, in, in your description of Dracon, where he used the penalty of death for those who failed to comply with his rules and regulations, folks, I think it was an apt description because these rules are draconian. Because like Dracon, if people refuse to abide by the advice and guidance that this Department of Health has given, that the measures that are in this bill, we will cost others' lives. And that's where they are draconian. And that's why they have to be enforced. And I think that's why, if we take these steps now, we have the ability to fight back against this virus that is hitting us across Northern Ireland at this minute in time. He also asked in regards to the civil contingencies legislation, this bill is to supplement and enforce any gaps that were found within our legislation, Scottish legislation, Welsh and English legislation, to make sure that we were encapsulating those gaps of provision that were there, and probably going further in the challenges to, to civil liberty that we, we, we value and we endear um, in our country. So it's about supplementing and supporting the legislation that's there and plugging that in. And it has been um, on a four-nation approach uh, to make sure that those pieces of legislation are encapsulated, aren't consistent across, across, the, across the country. Um, I, I know you and John O'Dowd had a, had, a, had, a, had a challenge in regards to, to, to um, where you were going. Your points, your questions are, are well made, and John's response was, was equally valid. Folks, will I use the army? Will I call in the army if I have to? If we get to a stage that they can provide a service that we can't, folks, I'll use whoever's at my disposal. I'll use whatever tool I have at my disposal to tackle this virus. If the Irish army want to come up and help us too, when they've sorted down there, I'd be more than happy to welcome them. So, folks, let's not let this debate or this issue be politicised, because it hasn't to date. And I don't think it would serve this House or the individuals well. And I know that wasn't where the members were going, but it was legitimate concerns. But what I do want to put on record is the co-working that we've already had between East, West and North, South, from our chief medical officers, from the public health agency here in Northern Ireland, from the HSE in South. Our first case in Northern Ireland was someone who travelled through Dublin. We were able to sort that contract case out because of the the establishment and the relationship that we both have on either sides of the border. So there is ability to work across borders, all borders, 
If we have to use it, we will. Um, in regards, I, I, I think um, um, in regards to I think points that both uh, Jim Allister and Claire Sugden asked in regards to definitions about security and social security and the issues related in regards to statutory sick pay. I, I don't have the detail. And there's no point of me even trying to, to look on it in this file because I, I've been leading the health bit I've been left with with the delivery of this bill, but I'll get the answers for the members because for, for the questions that users are asked and are up and the, 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 part, the Minister of Communities um, has come into the Chamber to make another statement. I don't know if some of her statement will cover some of the questions um, that are being raised. Um, uh, Jerry McCarroll's contribution he asked for, for regular updates have already committed. I'll come back and give updates on, on the health components of this bill. In regards to notifications of migrants to the, the Home Office, no, I won't do it. Um, and for the access to, to free health care, um, COVID-19 is now a notifiable disease, so there should be no restriction. And there is no restriction in Northern Ireland in our NHS in, in receiving free health care anyway, so it's not, it, it's not a concern um, that, sh that should be there. Uh, the contributions then, I think it was the final contribution then from, from Claire Sugden. Um, this is about the people. This is about ensuring that as many as our, of our people survive, and that's why this leg legislation is being brought forward in regards to statutory sick pay and all the rest of it. The Minister of Communities, I'm sure, will, will update the House at some time. Um, as again, she asked you know, about the Assembly questions. I, I, I covered that, that point earlier, um, and um, she has. She has been in contact with me about a number of cases, and we'll, and we'll keep working. We'll keep working with those. Um, in regards to executive colleagues coming here to provide regular updates, um, if I was nervous or, or fret of, of members' input into this debate or whatever I was doing, um, I wouldn't be standing here. I wouldn't have taken the, the legislation forward and brought it here. So, I think she can be assured from me for that commitment. But again, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to emphasise that the measures in the coronavirus bill are temporary. They are proportionate to the threat we face and will only be used when strictly necessary and will remain in place for as long as required to respond to the situation. Mr Speaker, the provisions within the bill are intended to protect life, the health of the public and to ensure that health and social care staff are supported to deal with the significant extra pressure which is being placed on the health system. I would like to put on record my thanks to Executive colleagues for their ongoing collaboration and support throughout this process. I believe that this has undoubtedly shown how the Executive can work collectively and effectively together with one clear purpose, which is to ensure that we have the necessary legislative measures in place to deal with the outbreak of COVID-19. I would like to express my gratitude to the Health Committee for all its efforts and assistance, and to all the other committees who have taken forward their different parts of this bill. In particular, I am grateful to the committees for taking the time to examine the legislative consent memorandum relating to the bill, for the pragmatic approaches that they have taken on this issue, and their positive engagement with all officials. I must also add that all of these actions were performed within a very demanding timescale. And I would like to thank the chairs and the members of the committees for their endeavours. Finally, I also want to pay tribute to our brilliantly selfless health and social care staff across all our professions who are working tirelessly to care for our friends and loved ones in this unprecedented period. Staff across all departments and well this, as well as this House and the Assembly who have worked over the last number of weeks with their colleagues in Wales and Scotland and England to make sure that we had a bill that actually brought, forwards, uh, brought forward the needs and the requests of this House. But it's also to thank those other backroom staff who are working tirelessly in the preparation as to how we flatten the peak, but will eventually have to tackle the peak. So for those professionals within my department, for those professionals in the Health and Social Care Board, for the professionals in the Public Health Agency to use all, I personally thank you at this minute in time, because the worst is yet to come. 
But by planning for the worst and working for the best, I believe we will get through this. However, it is important that we all play our part and we must all work together. From businesses prioritising the welfare of their employees to people continuing to do the basic things, like thoroughly washing your hands. In conclusion, I want to reiterate that I consider the coronavirus bill to be an important and positive measure which will help to ensure that Northern Ireland departments have the necessary legislative measures available so that we are all well prepared to respond in a way that offers substantial protection to the public. In practical terms, I believe that members understand the importance for Northern Ireland provisions to be included in the bill and will give their support to the motion today. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to pass on my personal condolences to the families of those who have already lost someone to COVID-19. There will be more, but by taking the responsible actions in this House, we can reduce that number. Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. Members, the question is that the amendment standing in the name of the Minister be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next item of business is a motion to approve the statutory rule. I will ask the clerk to read.